barriers. <clears throat> the taller I become, the farther you take my rights away. So, brother, brother, uh, Ajuma, uh, do you want me to mute everybody when you start? You can yeah, deny uh -huh. me. Okay. okay. You can decide to turn your face away. No matter, cause there's something inside so strong. I know that I can be. It's a very powerful song. This song was no, written by South American artist and played all over the world. It was an inspirational, all inspiring kind of song. It's called Something Inside So Strong. It's really, really powerful. We play it every week. Lego Flying, how you doing, brother? Man, it's good to see you, brother. Good to see you, bro. Good to be seen, brother. Oh, yeah. I was just telling Sister Robin, we just playing a song to kind of hold hold people over. Because uh, some of them might log on a little late, but at least they know they're in the right place. Right. behind walls of Jericho. Your lies will come tumbling. Hey, Rob. My place in time. You squander wealth, that's mine. My light will shine so brightly it will blind you. Because there's something inside so strong, so strong. I know that I can make it. How you like that scream, Melvin? You're doing me wrong, so wrong. Very professional. Glad you like it. I like the colors. Yeah, that's really nice, man. Right? Did you pull that together with them? Did you pull that together with Yeah, did you pull that together with and everything? Uh-huh. Brothers and sisters, when they insist we're just not good enough. When we know better, just look them in the eye.
Brother Alvin, good to see you, brother. Hey, how you doing, Muhammad? Hey, look, how you, you doing? Getting young and younger, brother. The higher Got that you found build youth your over barriers. there. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, man, you got to give me some of that. Yeah, how you been doing? Good, man. It's great to see you, brother. Good. Yeah, you give me inspiration. Who did you playing? I will run. It's a brother out of South Africa named Libby Godfrey. Wrote this empowerment song during the uh, time of the uh, protest, the apartheid. Oh uh, yeah, you know they still, like, you know they still not really free, man. Right, right. Oh, only way they could be free, they got to get, you know, who out of there and control all these people, and get their land back. Oh yeah, no doubt. You thought that my pride was gone. We're gonna have some fun today, brother Alvin. So put your seatbelt on. Something inside okay. so strong. Brother James, how we doing? Doing fine. Good to see you, black man. Welcome home. You hide behind yes. Yes. What's up, Big Mike? How we doing? Hey, what's up? Huh? All right, I see you rolling with the mask on there. It look like you anyway. Okay. Welcome to the Zoom, brother. You're in the house full of people. Hey, everybody, doing? Good, good. We got the music playing right now. Something inside so strong, so strong. I know that I can make it. No, you're doing me wrong, so wrong. You thought that my pride was gone. Oh, no. Something inside so strong. Brothers and sisters, when they insist we're just not good enough. But we know better, just look them in the eyes and say, we're gonna do it anyway. We're gonna do it anyway. There's something inside so strong. I know that I can make Brother Lane. Hey, brothers, how you all feeling? Oh, we got all of you at the top of the house. Dr. Jewel, what's going on, bro? Oh, man, it's official now. We got you in the house, brother. Oh, man, it was, hey, it was official when you all set it up. <laughs> brother oh, Alvin, man. how you doing, man? How you doing, How you doing? Hey, good man, I'm good. You, I'm better now. See your face, man. How you feel? You looking good, man. I'm a reflection of you, man. Can't be nothing without my brother. I, hear you. I, hear you. I always tell Brother Alvin, look like you're getting young and younger there. Yeah, Brother Alvin Sharp, man. I have to start calling him Benjamin Button. Look like he's going, he's reversing in the 80s. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Brothers and sisters, when they insist we're just not good enough. Robin, I don't know if you know that you can record it also. It's when recording. Okay, awesome. Just look them in the eye. You see me rocking. You rock and roll. We're going to do it anyway. We've learned how to do it. Let me stand in my lane. Let me stand in my lane. I got the memo. I got the memo. I got the Make some good music right here. This, this liberation theology right here. Yes, sir. Brother Melvin, if it's okay with you, we're right at four. I want to maybe let this play one more time, give people a chance. We might be logging on a little late. Are you okay with that? Oh, yeah, I'm okay with that. Yeah. You probably want to have a few come in. Come on in. Dewan, oh, man. So my main man, 50 grand. How you doing, brother? Good to see you. Good to be seen. Still shooting that left hand temple, man? No, it's 
is retired. Something inside. I don't know, man. I'm about to call you the rifle, man. Man, I don't know. I don't know if that could ever be retired. Yeah, you won't. You won't let me age, man. Ain't nobody shooting jumpers at 61. <laughs> I don't know, man. When you got it, you got it. You still got it. The higher you build your bad. Might not be able to do it alone, but you still got it. How's your mom, brother? Uh, Dwan. Yeah, she hanging in there, man. It's good, bro. Hanging in there. Staying patient. I will run. It's beautiful, bro. It's good to see you, man. It's been a minute. You can deny right. me. You can decide <laughs> to turn your face. This is a meme in the house. Yes, she is. How are you? Good. Representing that West Coast. <laughs> Hey, so yes, yes. Good to see you. Good to see you. I know that I have some fun today. How long are you gonna be able to stay with us? We're gonna rock and roll. So okay. that my pride was gone. Oh no. Something inside so strong. Oh, something inside. Liberation song that so comes strong. out of South Africa. Building the apartheid regime. Brother Lobby C. Frey. The more you made that song. to hear my voice, the louder I will sing. Hey, Dr. Duma, it's me. Hey, my brother. What's up, Jay? How you doing, brother, man? It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm glad you could chime in. Welcome to the Royal Family. It's good to be here. Yes, sir. Can't, can't wait to give me the good word.
Okay, brother Juma, I'm going to mute everybody. Okay. Unmute yourself. Let me see the link again. Okay. I'll, I sent you wrong. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Brother Juma, unmute yourself. I guess I can do it. Sister Robin, can you hear me? I hear you. I got you. Awesome. Did uh, Melby want to say anything before I get started? Unmute yourself, Melvy. I just want to welcome everyone. My name is Melvy Shahi. For those who are new on the line, I am a prostate cancer survivor and the founder and the president here at the Empowerment Network. And I want to welcome everyone out to really, this is the first one, but uh, Dr. Juma under our mental health series today. So uh, Dr. Juma, just take it away. This is your show, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me back up just for a second. Okay, here we go. Uh, good afternoon, uh, assalamu alaikum, which means peace be unto you. I pray that Almighty God would bless my tongue in the next few moments I have here with you guys to hopefully say something that will inspire you and motivate you. Today is really all about self-care and I hope the message is universal and applicable to everybody on this phone and I pray that you get something out of it. Also, too, we're going to cover a lot of information, and I think the favorite part of the program for me is going to be we're going to open the floor for some questions, because I think when we dialogue with one another, we all get so much out of it. I'm here to tell you that I don't know all the answers. However, this is my background. I've been in private practice for over 30 years. I've treated many patients and clients that deal with a range of issues from depression to bipolar to low self-esteem. Um, I do a little work in hypnosis. I've been working with adolescent boys uh, for approximately 30 years. I used to run an African-American role model program called the Association of African-American Role Models. I'm happy to say that that program uh, existed uh, for approximately 20 years and we had over 50,000 young people to come through that program. So everywhere I go, wherever I'm blessed to go, I always say that one man or one woman can make a difference. You just never know how God might inspire you regardless of your situation and circumstances to be an instrument of hope and liberation for the entire world. Uh, many of you may not know Brother Melvy was diagnosed and you can correct me on the year Brother Melvy approximately 13, 14 years ago. And as a result of him reaching out to Almighty God uh, to spare his life, God used him as a conduit to create the Empowerment Network, which has been instrumental in helping hundreds of men better understand the disease of prostate cancer uh, to become educated, also helping men to identify and get resources badly needed in our particular community. So we thank Almighty God for him. So brothers and sisters, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try, I'm going to uh, just kind of go through some of the slides, uh, have a lot of good things for you. Uh, if you've been logged on for a few minutes, you heard the song called Something Inside So Strong. That song came about as a result of the protest in South Africa many, many years ago. And it was a liberation theology kind of song that was inspired, that was uh, developed to inspire the people of South Africa to help them to overcome the, the racist apartheid regime. And so that's a very, very powerful song and you can find it on the internet on YouTube. Uh, we play it every week. It's a very inspiring, inspirational kind of uh, song. So it's very powerful. It should almost be our national anthem, particularly for people of color or if you're an African-American. So with that being said, welcome, welcome, and welcome more. Uh, welcome to the critical need for self-care during this 2020 pandemic crisis. Uh, the world is in the middle of, of a mental health crisis. Uh, you see, I have this highlighted in red because it's really that serious. The last time I checked CNN, the death toll was at 245,000. That is serious. That is very, very serious. I don't think anybody on this Zoom conference would argue with, argue with me about 2020 has been one hell of a year. Uh, that goes without saying. Death is all around us. 
people are being diagnosed with uh, uh, this virus and it's very, very serious. We're losing family members, we're losing loved ones, we're losing friends, we're, we're losing people just all over the place. So 2020 has been one, one hell of a year. Brothers and sisters, make note of these two points. This is very, very important. All health begins with mental health. You might wanna write it down or I'll send you this presentation after the, uh, the uh, presentation. But all health begins with mental health. So mental health is very, very serious. Remember this, and this is very important. You are a product of the consistent thoughts that you think both consciously and unconsciously and the consistent beliefs that you hold which guides your behavior. Now, what does that mean? That means whatever your thoughts are dominated by, good, bad, or indifferent, that becomes you. And so it's very important to think good thoughts, particularly during this time of this pandemic crisis. We're about to go into the winter months. There's a thing called seasonal depression. So when we don't have the, uh, the vitamin D or we don't see sunlight every day, it has a way of impacting you uh, socially and, uh, and uh, subconsciously. And it can have an effect on your outlook and the way that you see things with a cloudy overcast. When you see sun, when you see water, it's very therapeutic when you see those things. Moving right along. I wanna give very special recognition to Melvi Shaheed for his vision of raising the awareness surrounding prostate cancer. Sister Robin, a special salute and thanks to you as the executive uh, administrator of the Empowerment Network. Uh, the job that you, you do on a daily basis is very powerful, very needed and very necessary. So big shout out to you. Big shout out to the board of directors, the survivors and their families. And again, all of you who have volunteered and support this worthwhile organization. We thank you and we can never thank you enough. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Your presence here today represents hope for our community. Uh, this workshop is designed to empower you to action while helping you to understand the value of mental health. And brothers and sisters, I've been blessed to travel the world. I've been to 60 different countries. And one of the things that I, that's a common thread is uh, there are three kinds of people in this world. Those that watch things happen, those that make things happen, those who don't know what the heck has who don't know what the heck is happening. And you got to ask yourself the question, which one are you? Because if you get information and it lies dormant and you don't do anything with it, then shame on you. You want to be a light in the midst of our community and empower others, empower others through your example and also empower others through education and information and being a support, particularly during this time of this pandemic crisis. So you make the choice, which one are you? Those that watch things happen, make things happen, and don't even know what the heck is happening. All right, next slide. COVID care and protection. I say this every time I have an opportunity to get in front of any particular group. If you have survived thus far not getting COVID-19, then consider yourself blessed and highly favored. Almost everybody's getting this virus is serious. I'm encouraging you to please wear masks, Please practice social distancing, a minimum of six feet. Please refrain from going around others who refuse to wear masks. You have some people who are knuckleheads. They still don't believe this virus is real, although you got 200 and almost 50,000 people dead, a quarter of a million people. And please don't get comfortable because the virus is unseen. You don't know who have it and who don't have it. And so during this holiday period, try to connect with your loved ones over Zoom or WebEx or FaceTime or any other social visual medium that you can use to kind of reconnect because you just don't know. If you have elderly people, if you have senior citizens, their immune system may not be as strong. And so by virtue of you going around them, it could mean, you know, they get impacted by this virus. Okay, moving right along. Goals for the day, brothers and sisters. I wanna discuss prevention. Prevention is very important prevention and intervention strategies that promote mental health awareness and development. I want to empower you to take charge of your life and your health. Increase your awareness about the various strategies that could be employed to create a new and renewed way of thinking that results in a reduction of stress and anxiety. I'm here to tell you, stress and anxiety will kill you. It will take you off the planet, okay? 
It is very serious and it's nothing to play with. Okay, before we go forward, I would like for all of you to agree to this. You don't have to come out off mute to agree with it, but this is a group participation kind of experience and exercise. I'd like for you to be open and honest. I'd like for you to be open to change. You must be willing to think outside the box. You must be willing to share your feelings, be open to different opinions expressed by others. We may not all agree on everything. 99% uh, of what I say may be right on point and the 1% you disagree, don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Take the 99% and disregard the other 1% that you don't necessarily agree with. I've been to lectures, I've given lectures and I've seen people because we weren't in 100% alignment, they missed the bigger picture of what was being said and we don't want that to happen. Take whatever information of value that works for you and make it work for you, you know? Nothing wrong with that. All participants must be willing to agree before we can move forward. By virtue of you signing on to the Zoom conference, I think you're on board with it. So I'm assuming that everybody is on board with that. Okay, this is very, very important. Please note this. All health begins with mental health. What is mental health? Mental health is your mental state of mind. Every day we are impacted by a thousand different choices, choice selections, moving parts, people, entities, situations, circumstances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And every day your mental state of mind is going to fluctuate but it's important to maintain a healthy equilibrium and a healthy balance. Spiritual health. Spiritual health is your relationship with your higher power or your creator. Spiritual health is very, very important because you can have the mental health in, in, in check and you can have your physical health in check, but if you overlook the spiritual health, then you have an imbalance. Or let's just say your spiritual health is on point, but your physical health is neglected. So you don't want to be like a disabled person or, or you don't want to be wobbly in your position. You, you want to be like a pyramid. You want to have a foundation. You want to have all of these three entities working in alignment with each other, your mental health, your spiritual health, and physical health. You can go to the gym every day, but if your mental health is not strong or you're mentally weak, it's not a good thing. Or if you go to the gym every day, you, you lack it, you're lacking in your spiritual health. You want, again, you want them to all work in concert with one another. Next slide, self-care definition, very important. Self-care is any activity that we do deliberately in order to take care of our mental health, our emotional health, and our physical health. That's what self-care is. It's an investment in yourself. Good self-care is key to improve mood and reduce stress and anxiety. Black men have the highest rate of prostate cancer in the world. And one of the things that's overlooked oftentimes is the fact that we struggle with stress and anxiety probably more than any other ethnic group or more than any other entity on the planet, Black men. And so again today, we're gonna to kind of talk about some strategies and better ways to effectively manage that stress. It's also, key to, uh, it's also key to a good relationship with oneself and others. When you feel good about yourself, you're in a healthy place, you're going, to, you're going to be able to relate to others in a very prominent key healthy kind of way as opposed to being at a deficit. Moving right along, mental state, what is it? Your emotional, physical, mental health is your wealth. That's probably one of the most powerful things that I could say here today your mental health, your physical health, your emotional health is your wealth. It's like money in the bank. If you take a guy who's a billionaire, but he neglected his health, he'll give up that billion dollars to get a kidney. I know people who've been waiting on the uh, list to get a kidney, kidney now for the last 10, 12, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so that's why your, your, your health is your wealth. It's, it's probably your greatest wealth, okay? It's not, and this is key too, it's not what happens to you, but how you choose to respond to a situation oftentimes determine the outcome. So if you're in a situation, let's say, Sister Robin, you're driving down the street and you're driving around with a new Audi that, that uh, you've been dreaming about for a long time. And there's a youngster behind you and he, he, he bumps into the back of your car. And you're like, you know, man, this person just bumped in the back of my new car. I, I can choke him out. 
I can pull out my gun and shoot him, or I can give him some redirection and go about my business. Well, if you decide to get out your car and shoot him, then he's dead and you go to jail and you lose that beautiful Audi. Or you can give him some redirection, more than likely he won't do it again. So brothers and sisters, for those of you who are on this, on this Zoom conference, it's not what happens to you. We all are going to deal with stress, anxiety, situations, life situations every single day. So it's not what happens to you, it's how you choose to respond to it that determines the outcome. So very important. Daily trauma. Daily trauma is real and it has an emotional psychological toll on the body, thereby creating a breakdown of the body system. High blood pressure, weight gain, loss, stress, and anxiety giving rise to multiple cancers. Okay. Today, we want to kind of peel back the onion and we want to look at some of the residual trauma that perhaps you've been carrying around with over the past 10, 15, 20 years that has built up that you don't even know is there. And so by recognizing it, then you can kind of put a, a formidable plan in place to kind of address it, to reduce it and better manage it. And so, you know, when you have daily trauma that's unresolved, it builds up, it increases your blood pressure, you gain weight, you lose weight, and it opens the door to other problems. What is trauma? Moving right, right along. Trauma stress is any demand placed on your brain and also your physical body. People report feeling traumatized or stress. Sometimes you feel like the weight of the world is on you. When multiple competing demands are placed on them, the feeling of being stressed out or burned out, traumatized, can be triggered by an event that makes you feel frustrated or nervous. Trauma anxiety is a feeling of fear, worry, or unease. Some people struggle with fear every single day. And so again today, we're gonna kind of talk about some tools to kind of address that and better manage that. The daily threat of police brutality and black on black homicide is detrimental to your emotional mental health resulting in PTSD, which I call post-traumatic survival disorder. You think about it brothers and sisters, when you turn on the media, CNN or whatever news station you might be watching and you see the brutality that is imposed or heaped upon people of color, particularly black folks, that has a residual psychological effect on you and it can create a sense of impending doom. And so all of those kind of things weigh in on us emotionally and psychologically. And again, because it happens to us and usually uh, unique to us, we're the only ones who really understand it. The larger community don't really understand it because those things don't typically happen to them. Okay, moving right along. 2020, the year of COVID-19 and the pandemic crisis worldwide. This is where we find ourselves, 245,000, it might be 250,000 now, have died in the USA. 10.9 million cases have been reported. 50,000 people have been hospitalized. I don't know if you knew that. Now we're talking worldwide. 53 million cases were reported worldwide. 34, 35 million people have recovered and 1.3 30, 1.31 million people have died from COVID-19 thus far. So we're talking 10 million cases just in the United States alone. At some point, I hate to say it, we're all probably gonna end up with this virus. Uh, and then if you know anything about some of the medical abuses that have happened historically to black people and the uh, like the uh, Tuskegee experiment, and so when this vaccine does become available, it's gonna be troublesome for a lot of black people to even accept that because of some of the historical, historical abuses. That's another story for another time, but that's kind of where we are. If you look at this picture right here, this is where we are, okay? Moving right along. You know, brothers and sisters, I said that the world is in the middle of a mental health crisis. You say, why? Why are we in the middle of a, a, a mental health crisis? Well, one, because we're in a pandemic uh, which has produced COVID-19. Number two on this list, Donald Trump presidency and the racial divide. So dumb, dumb in the White House, number 45 and his lack of leadership, excuse me, and his lack of leadership 
when he had an opportunity to get on top of the situation, he didn't. And telling people to take Lysol and some of the other ridiculous, absurd things that he suggested thus far has opened the door to almost a quarter of a, pe quarter of a million people dying from this virus. So it has produced a state of emergency. Police brutality, Mike Brown right here in Ferguson, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, list goes on and on. So we as black people, people of color, we're in a very unique situation. You got nationwide protests of racial injustice, police being exonerated, number five, police being exonerated for the killing of black men and women, Sandra Bland, the daily homicides in the black community. You know, a lot of times we talk about um, what the police do to us, but we have to also recognize what we're, what we're doing to ourselves is very, very serious, you know? So black on black crime. Uh, number seven, sense of hopeless, hopelessness followed by gloom and doom. When you see us killing us, when you see the police killing us, when you see a system that is not fair, just, and, and equitable, it produces a sense of hopelessness. Uh, lawlessness, lawlessness throughout the black community, unemployment and uncertainty in the economy, daily acts of racism. Seem like no matter where you go, you're running into a Karen or a Ken. What is a Karen? <clears throat> Usually a white female that is overly dramatic about a simple situation that has been amplified and, uh, and uh, multiplied that doesn't fit the situation. And it creates just problems uh, throughout the community and throughout the nation. Uh, and we see that all too often. There was a situation in New York where a brother was bird watching and a white woman called, <laughs> she called 911 and uh, uh, indicated, I think that she was being attacked or raped, one of the two. But anyway, she over, over dramatized the situation and it was caught on camera. And that should be used as a case study. It really should, because so many black men have died at the white at the hands of white police officers and white mobs because a white woman made a false claim like that that resulted in that black man's death, hanging or being being lynched to burn. And so to see that in 2020, you know, when we had Barack Obama as president, a lot of us became comfortable and so we thought racism was a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. Well, Donald Trump and America is showing you all together different. Don't go to sleep. But to see how that particular Karen in, in uh, Central Park had dramatized that situation and the brother caught it on camera, it was that should be a case study for anybody who really wants to understand racism and how it impacts people of color. Number 10, a sense that the world is against Black people. Suicide is on the rise right now. Daily stress that come with a routine traffic stop. Now, this is real deep here, so I don't want to run through it too quick. I tell you, if you, you're on the, Zoom, on the Zoom call, I'm sure you can relate to this. When we get pulled over by the police, we don't know if we're going to make it home. If a white person is pulled over by the police, they don't even think, they don't even give it a second thought. So our particular reality is completely different. This produces stress, anxiety. So we as people of color, if we're already dealing with medical challenges, now we add the stress component, the anxiety component, it creates, it exacerbates our condition and our situation. Okay, very important. If you got breath in your body, you're dealing with one of these issues. And all of these issues may not apply to you, but I guarantee some of these issues do apply to you. And this is why you heard me say previously how stress and anxiety will kill you if you don't know how to manage it. And so often we as black men, we don't go get proper checkups. We don't go to the doctor. We have this kind of Superman mentality that I'm just going to ride it out, which uh, in, in return produces uh, exacerbated uh, uh, more health problems and physical problems. So I'm going to just kind of run through this list here. Um, if you're on this phone, you might be dealing with child support. Maybe, maybe not. Some of us are a little older on this phone, but child support, maybe marital issues. Blended family, what is a blended family? Blended family is when you bring two families together under one roof and you have um, competing ideologies in terms of how that family should go, be raised, the things they do or shouldn't do. 
So blended family, relationship issues. If you're married, you're planning to get married, you've gotten married, been married for a while, you got relationship issues. You got work-related stress issues, legal issues, drug and alcohol issues, probation and parole issues, black on black homicide, suicide, racial issues being black in America, police brutality issues, legal issues, personal issues, literacy issues, negative image of the black male issued, fostered by mainstream America, self-inflicted issues, you create problems for yourself. Sometimes that happens. So the point is, is that if you're breathing, you're dealing with something, trust and believe. I don't care who you are, including myself. You know, although this is what I do for a living, um, still doesn't mean that I am exempt. Now I wanna run through this real quick. It seemed long, but it's not really that long. I want to uh, give you a couple of quick responses to the field of mental health and therapy, and then we're going to get into some good stuff. I have a little short motivational video that I want to share with you, and um, we're going to go over some self-care techniques, and then we'll open the floor for some questions. So stay with me. So questions and answers. Do you have to be crazy or mentally ill to see a therapist? Absolutely not. Uh, it makes sense that if you're hurting or struggling with an issue or issues to reach out, to a professional who can help you navigate the challenges that, that beset you. If you wanna learn about finances, why would you not talk to a financial planner? If you got plumbing issues, well, you can try to do it yourself, but it's probably best to call somebody who has, who's been trained in the, in the field of plumbing. Same thing with uh, being an auto mechanic. You may know how to change a, a, a flat tire, but you don't know how to change a timing chain. It's probably best to call a mechanic. So there's nothing wrong with reaching out, okay? Two. Uh, is going to my pastor preach at my church sufficient enough for me instead of going to see a therapist? Pastors and, and uh, preachers are not trained clini clinicians, nor do they have the time or expertise to provide clinical strategies to address complex issues. Oftentimes, we have very, very complex issues, and your pastor is not, this is not what they went to school for. This is not what they're trained to do. Three, what is a psychological evaluation? A psychological evaluation is defined as a way of testing people about their behavior, personality, and capacity, uh, capabilities to draw conclusions using a combination of techniques. Sometimes you, you want to understand, am, am I, am I uh, struggling with depression? Do I have uh, ADHD, um, attention deficit disorder? Uh, am I struggling with bipolar? So these are just tools, tools that we use to kind of help better understand just where you find yourself. What is the difference between the psychiatrist, psychologist, and psychotherapist? Psychiatrists are MDs. They prescribe, they, uh, prescribe medications uh, uh, who provide psychotropic medication for their patients who struggle with mental health and psychological issues. What is a psychologist? A psychologist specializes mainly in testing, research, and therapy, but mainly in clinical and psychological assessing a client's mental state. They do a lot of testing. What is a psychotherapist? I, I am a psychotherapist. I'm a trained psychotherapist. I specialize in psychosocial assessments, but mainly in long-term therapy with clients. So usually after you see a psychiatrist, if you go and see a psychiatrist who give you medication, they're going to refer you out to see a therapist, somebody who can provide long-term support for you. Those are the difference between the three. Okay, let me go back. Uh, how long, how long, how long, would, how long does therapy last? Well, that's a very individual kind of thing. It really kind of depends on the gravity of your issues and how willing you are to participate in therapy. If you're really open to it or if you're resistant, if you're reluctant, if you, uh, if you shut down, it just kind of depends. So um, that's an individual kind of thing. So the more willing that a patient is to be open and uh, to do the homework and to work in concert and partnership, with the therapist, you can address those issues and get to the goal that much faster versus somebody who is resistant. Okay, moving right along. You've seen this prayer before. I live by this prayer. This is a very powerful prayer. And this can help you. I don't care what your situation is. You got to recognize what you can do and what you can't do. So I say this prayer all the time. And this prayer is a prayer that is typically used for people who are struggling with drugs and alcohol in AA. It's called the serenity prayer. The serenity prayer, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I, I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. 
that right there, I promise you, if you use that in your everyday life, it'll kind of help you put things in perspective. It'll help you understand the things you can do, the things you can't do, and the wisdom know the difference. And so it's a very powerful tool. Moving right along, prostate cancer diagnosis. So uh, some of the individuals on this phone have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, not everybody, but some of the people on, the, on this phone. The diagnosis of any form of cancer does not have to be a death sentence. I heard the great Pat Riley, who was the basketball coach for the Lakers and the Miami Heat. He said this, he said, adversity, meaning when you have to deal with some adversity introduces a man or woman to himself uh, or herself. I heard Mike Tyson say this once. He said, you can't, have a, you can't have a testimony without being tested. So when you get this diagnosis of prostate cancer or any form of cancer, you're, you're about to be challenged. You're about to be tested. And the real you is about to come out. You're getting ready to find out what you're made out of. You can crawl up in a hole or you can stand up and you can fight a head on. You can be an advocate for others or, you know, again, you can roll over. Uh, number two. It is important to put yourself at the top of your to-do list and to make yourself a priority instead of others. So when you get this diagnosis, or even before you get this diagnosis, you should always put yourself at the top of your to-do list. So often we give to others and we neglect ourselves in the process. And you know, if any of you have ever been on an airplane, they'll tell you in any event of some turbulence to do what? Put the mask on yourself first before you can help others. So put the mask on yourself and then you might be in a position to help others. But if you're, if you're falling, if you're struggling and you put everybody else before you, you can't very well do anything for anybody else. And the question I want you to ask yourself, are you really living your best life? You know, some people are really living to die. Also too, brothers and sisters, ask yourself, what is your legacy and what will your legacy be? This is something, I'm going to say something that most of you may not find very comfortable. Sometimes your death is a relief to other family members because your contribution to this life has not been much. Some people are a burden on their family. And so their death becomes a relief to the family. So you don't want to do that. You want to be an asset to your family. You want to be an asset to your community and you should be striving to leave a legacy. Hope you got that. Okay, so the Empowerment Network. We have developed a program here, a mental health support program, where number one, we offer, if you look up there, you see indiv individualized psychotherapy once a week. And the cool thing about the Empowerment Network, now most of us have iPads, we can all connect virtually. We don't have to be in the building. We don't have to spread this virus or this disease. This is cool. This is called adjustment and adaptation, where we've adjusted and adapted to the situation, which is a very beautiful thing. Thank you, Melvy. Thank you, Sister Robin. Thank the Empowerment Network for getting us all connected. But this is what we're able to offer. We're able to offer individual therapy, virtual mental health, and self-care seminars like what we're doing now. That's what this is now. And remember, brothers and sisters, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power when you use it. Now, if you get this knowledge, you get this information, you just sit on it, then shame, shame, shame on you, okay? We also offer family therapy for the spouse, okay? So those of you on this, on this Zoom call who've been diagnosed with this uh, disease, we're able to offer spousal support and spousal therapy because it's a family, the entire family is infect, affected by this disease. But again, it doesn't have to be a death sentence, okay? This is a collaborative effort for all of us to work in concert and partnership with one another where we can provide the best level of care for each one of us, thereby extending our life, okay? Emphasis on self-care and empowerment. Uh, our goal in mental health is to equip prostate cancer survivors with the tools necessary to work through their personal challenges as they contend with this disease. Survivors will gain education and information concerning various community resources that are available to them. Now, just think about this brothers and sisters. There are a lot of states and communities that don't have an empowerment network, okay? So we are blessed and highly favored 
to have the leadership of Melvy and Sister Robin, the board of directors and those who support this worthwhile entity. Think about all the states that don't have this, this uh, organization or this component in their particular state. So men who get this diagnosis, they suffer in silence, they die in ignorance because they don't have a, a vessel or vehicle to be able to provide a healthy outlet and information. So a big shout out to you guys for running the uh, organization. But this is what we're able to provide. Now, I can't twist your arm and say, hey, you know, reach out and get you some emotional support, some therapeutic support. But we have a grant. We've offered it to many of you all. Some of you have taken advantage of it and some of you haven't. I don't understand if somebody's throwing you out a life rope, why you're not accepting it. But again, you know, we're putting it out there to you. It's, it's, it's on you to take advantage, but the service is definitely being offered to you. So we encourage you to take advantage of it. Now, uh, I want you to be inspired. So these are some people, again, that I think you should make note of, and I'm gonna show you a short video, it's very powerful. And then we'll get into some power quotes, some self-care things, and then uh, we'll open the floor up for some questions. Uh, so the first video that I'm going to show you is by a guy named Ron Archer. Um, you'll see that in a minute. These are some other people that inspire me. The great Les Brown, Eric Thomas, a, a very powerful motivational speaker, Willie, jo uh, Willie Jolly, Steve Harvey, Lisa Nichols. Very, very powerful people. I don't care who you are. We all can stand to be uh, uh, empowered through information, education, and just seeing the trials and tribulations of others. Uh, Steve Harvey was homeless once upon a time. Now he's a multimillionaire, soon to be a billionaire and helping out a lot of uh, young African-American boys. So, you know, I always tell people, it's not where you start in life, it's where you finish. You know, I've seen people come from the, the very nice homes, the best of situations and be the biggest loser, losers. And I've seen people come from the worst situations, the so-called worst situations, turn out to be the brightest stars. So you just never know. So I, I never pass judgment on people because you just, you just never know. So I want to show you this video now. Put your seatbelt on and enjoy. I was 10 years old and I held my mother's gun to my head and I wanted to blow my brains out all over her wall. You must ask the question, why would a 10-year-old child want to die? 10 is a time to dream of being an astronaut, of being a soccer star, a football player, a preacher, a pastor, a doctor. But for me, life was so horrific, with so much vitriol and pain, I wanted to die. I'm the product of interracial immigrants. My grandmother was tall, white, and thin from Germany, and we called her French fry. My grandfather was a big, burly black man from Cuba, and we called him hamburger. Hamburger met french fry and created a happy meal. And these two immigrants produced seven McNuggets with special sauce. We would joke that we would have Wiener Schnitzel with salsa for Thanksgiving. My grandfather had to hide the fact in the 1940s in America that he was married to a Caucasian woman. But one wedding anniversary, he had a flaw. He liked to drink overproof Cuban rum. And one evening, he was inebriated. And a man saw them together and said to my grandmother, why would you be a nigger lover? My grandfather, with huge arms, lost his temper and hit the man in the jaw and broke his neck. The man didn't die, but he was injured severely. He went to the worst prison, convicted of the crime. Mansfield Reformatory in Ohio, locked down 23 hours a day. 
It hit the newspapers that my grandmother was married to this convicted felon and she lost her job. But being a German woman, she didn't complain or whine or woe is me. She began to work odd jobs, cleaning other people's houses and toilets, taking care of their children. But as she was working, she would have fainting spells, passing out, doing her job. She went to the doctor and discovered that she had a tumor growing behind her left eye that was metastasizing to her brain. And the doctor said, we have to take out a third of your face, your eye. You will be malformed and disformed and disfigured for the rest of your life. What do you do when the American dream becomes an American nightmare? She could not work. She was sick and mutilated. My grandfather's in jail, and day by day, they lost everything that they had acquired. They lost their house. They lost their car. They lost their furniture. They lost their dignity. They lost their self-esteem, and they were living in the streets like animals. My three uncles got hooked on heroin. They belonged to a gang called the Devil's Disciple. And my entire family became atheistic. No God, no prayer, no Bible, no hope. And my mother at age 14 was called by a pimp named Larry who said to her, what is school doing for you? You are sitting on a gold mine. She said, where? He said, you're sitting on it. And we call this being turned out. And little by little, she began to sell her 14-year-old body to grown men for money to survive. It's called turning tricks. And at age 16, she got pregnant. We call it having a trick baby. Two strangers meet for a business transaction, and there's a mistake. The pimp said, you can't make any money having a baby in the oven. We have got to kill this baby. They kicked her in the stomach. They fed her alcohol. They gave her drugs. They took a hanger and stabbed the baby over and over again. But the baby would not die. The baby was born two months premature with no pancreas, a learning disability, a bladder too small, unable to function, a severe stutterer. We call it a trick baby. Nobody wants the baby. No hope, no future. Kill it was the word. That baby was me. I'm the lowest of the low. I come from the guttermost. I come from a hellish condition. And so when I would go to school, I couldn't talk. I stuttered so severely from the trauma. My mother had a madam who hated men. Her name was Dolores, and she was a sadist. And when she would watch me, she would take a broomstick and stick it in a place where no boy should have any object in his body. And when you are tortured like that, you learn four things. Don't talk. Don't trust. Don't feel and pretend nothing is happening. And by age 10, I had had enough. I want it to die. And in my school, they put me in a boiler room with other kids who were dysfunctional like me, where we would finger paint all day long. And yet there was a teacher, thank God for her, who had a Gideon Bible, and she came to my school, and she saw kids like me as her mission field. And she would give me this Gideon Bible and read to me stories of dysfunctional characters who God used. She would say to me, Ronaldo, God uses greatly those who have been wounded very deeply. He will turn your pain into power, your wounds into wisdom. She had me read the story of Moses, who was also a stutterer. I began to understand that God did love a trick baby. Even as low as I was, there was hope for me and possibility. And when a child begins to understand the love of God and the power of his word and the possibilities, it changes everything. How can a young man keep his way clean? by taking heed according to your word. Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. I began to memorize the Bible, that Gideon Bible, reading 2,000 scriptures. And when you put that kind of word in a life, 
Something begins to happen. My stuttering went away. I stopped wetting the bed. I stood tall. I became valedictorian, became a pastor, and preached until everybody in my family got saved. Why? Because somebody placed a Gideon Bible in a woman's hand that changed a life forever. Yes! I was born a trick baby, but the trick was on the devil because of you and the power of the word of God. I hope that uh, video inspired you. It certainly inspired me. Let me get us back to where we were. So moving right along, brothers and sisters, we're going to cover a few more things and then we'll open it up. <clears throat> Number one, I want you to think about this in terms of your own personal development. Everything is about ownership. Everything is about the choices we make, good, bad, or indifferent. I tell a lot of my clients, when you make good choices, you end up in a good place. When you make bad choices, you end up in a bad place. I always say when you make bad choices, you got to work 10 times harder to get back where you were before you got set back. So really your happiness is a state of mind and it's about you taking ownership. It's about you being accountable for your actions. Number three is about acceptance. Number four is about forgiveness. Some of you on this line here, you may be holding grudges. Maybe your wife did something to you. Maybe a husband, maybe somebody in the family did something to you. When you hold, when you hoard anger or when you hold grudges, it destroys you from the inside out. They have different uh, autoimmune diseases like lupus. And there's a lot of studies that show that people who hoard anger, the body starts to turn against itself. And so, you got to look at all these things in terms of your own personal health, your own emotional state of mind, your own personal state of mind, that if you're holding on to anger, somebody injured you or somebody did you wrong and you can't let it go. OK, I didn't say I didn't say forget it. But I am encouraging you to forgive that person or forgive that situation. Personal responsibility, choice and choice selection. We already talked about that. And those whom you surround yourself. Remember this, brothers and sisters, and you definitely want to note this here. You are the average of the five people that you are around. So if I want to know about Brother Melvy, if I want to know about Al Greer, if I want to name, know about uh, Andre McKinney, all I got to do is really look at your friends. And your friends tell me the whole story. And that's what old saying, birds of a feather flock together. Red birds hang out with red birds. Blue birds hang out with blue birds. So are you, are you surrounded by people who suck the living life out of you? Or are you around people that support you emotionally, who empower you, who believe in you, who see the value in you? All those kind of things either add to your stress, they add to your stress, or they put you in a situation where you're in a good place and that's one less stress that you have to deal with. And the last thing on the bottom is change. Don't be afraid to change. If what you have been doing in the past is not working, don't be, don't be afraid to change. Uh, it's not on this slide here, but I want to just throw it, to, throw it out to you. There, there is a saying that a bird born in a cage thinks that that's normal. And let that, let that marinate in your head for a second. A bird born in a cage thinks that that's normal. And there are instances where you can open the cage and the bird won't fly out because the bird wasn't trained to fly out. Or the bird who think that other birds outside the cage are flying think something is wrong with that bird. So you create your own happiness. You create your own mindset. And again, it's about how you look at things and how you respond to things that ultimately determines the outcome. So a bird born in a cage thinks that that's normal. A bird is meant by nature to fly and to soar. I'm telling you on this phone, each one of you are meant to fly. You're meant to soar. And there should be no limits placed upon your capacity, your capability, and what you have the ability to do. You just don't know, you know, but you got to change your way of thinking. All right. 
I want to run through a couple of these real quick. We're going to do them real fast. I won't expound on them too much because they speak for themselves. And then we'll get into some self-care things. And then we'll, we'll open the door up for uh, some feedback. One, life is about choices. Two, I already talked about it. Adversity introduces a man slash woman to himself or herself. Three, you're the average of the five people that you're around the most. We just talked about that. Two, uh, four, listen twice as much as you talk. Some, some people talk all the time and they're not really saying anything. God gave you two ears for a reason. You can learn a lot just by listening to people, you know, studying other people, looking at their body vibration. Is their energy negative or is their energy positive? Okay. But you get so much out of listening to other people. Uh, Moon right alone. There is no prosthetic for an amputated spirit. Okay. You shouldn't depend on other people to make you happy. You should, you, you are the author of your life. Put the things in place. Do the things and do the things necessary to make your own self happy. There's so there's no there, there's no cure for an amputated spirit. It's about self reflection. There's a saying that it's hard to see the picture when you're a part of the frame. What does that mean? The eye can look out, but the eye can't look back in. You have to you have to do self reflection and see what you're doing that makes you feel a certain kind of way. Uh, move right along. Don't seek other people's approval. Uh, you don't get what you wish for. You get what you work for. Can't be afraid to work. Whatever whatever your dreams are. Are you living to live or are you living to die? You know, victory only honors preparation. Everything is about preparation. What do you want to be five years from now? What do you want to be 10 years from now? How do you see yourself? Some people will see themselves waiting on a monthly check. Other people who have prepared and put things in place will live a glorious life. You only get one life. Why not make the best out of it? Uh, failure is not a, a move, the last one on the uh, page. Failure is not a single cast. I can never say that word event. You don't fail overnight. Instead, failure is a few errors in judgment repeated every day. Again, it's about taking a look at yourself. Are you happy? Are you where you want to be? Are you doing the things, are you putting the protocol of things in place to create happiness and create the kind of life and reality that you want to live? So it's not a single thing, it's repeated things. It's repeated things that you do every day, okay? All right, more power quotes. Get around people who have something of value to share with you. Their impact will continue to have a significant effect on your life long after they have departed. Nothing wrong with having a mentor. I have a group of men in my life I call my council of elders. I refer to them, I talk to them, I have communication with them all the time. The late great Dr. Robert L. Williams, who was a professor over at Washington University, he died about uh, maybe about two and a half, three months ago. And uh, he was a mentor and a personal friend of mine and we would talk all the time, two or three times a week. Leon Ashford, who was also, he wasn't necessarily one of my mentors, but he was a very good brother who also worked over at WashU and was a prostate cancer survivor as well. But he mentored a lot of people who came through WashU who had a history of racism. He provided all kinds of leadership and guidance for them. So it's not wrong with having positive people in your life who can influence you to do, to do great things. Moving right along. Successful people have libraries. The rest have big screen TVs. Increase your body of knowledge. Don't be afraid to read every day. Dr. Maulana Karinga, who started Kwanzaa, uh, I've heard him uh, in some of his lectures say he read at least three or four hours a day. I heard Brother Akbar Muhammad say that you can travel the world through books, mm -hmm. which is a very beautiful thing. And we've gotten away from it. Most of us have become Google brain now. We just hit Google and boom, you know, see what we can find. And then that's it. Uh, the worst days of those who enjoy what they do are better than the best days of those who don't. The worst days of those who enjoy what they do are better than the best days of those who don't. Find something that you really enjoy doing, that you're passionate about. Mel, we can never thank you enough, man, how God used you as an instrument of hope and liberation. So your legacy will carry on long after you're gone, brother. And that's a very beautiful thing. Those who will not read are no better off than those who cannot read. If you had a capacity to read and you don't read, then shame on you. Open yourself up to endless possibilities. If you find anybody who's rich or people who have made a monumental impact on the world, they read, you know, read the Bible, read the Holy Quran, read anything and everything you get your hands on. Uh, moving right along. 
we generally change ourselves for one or two reasons, inspiration or desperation. Well, be inspired. But if it's a result of desperation that moves you to different place in your life, then so be it. But look at all of these are things to reflect upon in terms of weighing where you are in your life and where you want to be. Without a sense of urgency, desire loses its value. Anybody can be motivated for the minute or the moment. You know, I talked to Melvin one day. I saw him. I don't know where we were, what was going on. I said, brother, you've been running this organization for about 13, 14 years. You need somebody to uh, carry on your legacy in the event that something happened to you. And really, each one of us should be saying to ourselves, how, how can I make the Empowerment Network bigger, better, more efficient? Uh, don't just come there and get what you need personally out of the organization, then you, then you move on. Find ways to enhance what they're doing or enhance whatever you might be doing that can help somebody else. Melvie has a brother named Anthony Shahid, and we talk about it all the time. A lot of times we play what is called first base safe. What is first base safe? Well, as long as my son is okay, as long as my daughter is okay, then that's all we're concerned about. We're not concerned about the neighbor down the street or, you know, somebody else in the in our community. I'm gonna tell you, in my 30 years of being a community activist and serving the community, I find that the more and more you give to others, the more and more God blesses you. What good does it do for you to go to church or go to the mosque and you know the Bible and you know the Quran, but you don't give to others? One thing I didn't share with this group here today and I just simply forgot, God blessed me to have two schools in Africa that I adopted. And I set a goal for myself. And the goal was to one of the schools uh, to send them money so that they could purchase computers. And the goal was to, uh, for them to acquire 100 computers. Well, right now we're at 40 computers and I'll be going back to Africa in March. And then the other school, I made a commitment to buy them, buy them a brand new van for students to be able to go to and from. So again, my legacy will be worldwide in the event that Almighty God calls me home. And each one of us should be thinking about our legacy. What will our legacy be? Okay, moving right along. Indecision is the thief of opportunity. The only thing worse than not reading a book in the last 90 days is not reading a book in the last 90 days and thinking that it don't matter. Increase your knowledge brothers and sisters. And if you don't want to read or maybe you can't read, go to YouTube. You know, YouTube, YouTube can be a great medium that you can use to educate yourself or you can download audio books. A lot of people do that. Now, we're getting ready to move into some self-care tips and techniques, okay? This is very, very important, very important and probably the most important part of this presentation. As previously stated, I don't care if you're alive, you're dealing with some kind of issue, you might be taking care of your mother right now. You may have a mother who's on hospice. Uh, Melvin, no, I lost my mom probably two and a half years ago. And anybody know that anytime you lose your mother, your foundation is rocked, you know? Some of us, we, can, we, we lose our fathers and we, we're kind of able to get over it a little bit better when you lose a mother because of the nurturing maternal connection you have with a mother, that's a whole different vibration. And those of us who are on the Zoom call who ever lost a mother, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you know that uh, a lot of times when you lose a mother, some, some people go into a severe depression for years because everybody deals with death differently. My mother and I, the last three years of her life, I had an opportunity to take care of her. And we would always joke and, and not that it was funny, but it was reality. And the reality was that nobody's getting out of this life alive. Ain't, no, ain't nobody getting out alive. So you might as well just go ahead and enjoy it while you're here. My mother used to always say, give me my flowers while I'm alive. Can't use them when I'm, when I'm in that box, you know? So when my mother transitioned, of course, I was deeply impacted and hurt by it. But I remember my mother's example. And my mother had volunteered in the community for over 23 years at the St. Patrick Food Pantry over in, in uh, North City, over on uh, Warney Avenue. And she helped people get their utilities paid, rent paid, furniture, food, et cetera, et cetera. And so I looked at my mother's example and because of her example, it inspired me to work even harder to make a difference in the world. 
And that's really what it's all about. If you remember the movie, The Lion King, when, when uh, Mufasa, the, the father lion passed away and Simba looked down in that pond of water and he had lost his mind because he didn't know who he was. He didn't know his value. He thought he was a bird. He thought he was a monkey. He thought he was all kinds of things. And in the movie, there was a female lion called Nala who kept trying to bring some sense in his head. At some point, the light of understanding or epiphany, if you will, entered into Simba's mind and he saw the spirit of his father was right there inside of him. So what I, I say that to say that the God that you're looking for is right there inside of you. God has given us plenty of examples. He's putting people in front of us that we can use as a reference point to be inspired and motivated. And that's really what it's all about. So he saw that the spirit of his father was inside of him. So Simba, he went back and he, he proclaimed that land and he became king. So when I lost my mom, I was inspired and motivated, Sister Robin, to go out, empower my community, establish a legacy, build others up, because that's what my mother would have wanted. She wouldn't, she wouldn't have wanted me to be sad. You know, you got work to do, so get up. Let's get about to work. Mm -hmm. So that's why when we first started this presentation, talking about prostate cancer, and we talked about it's not what happens to you, but it's how you choose to respond. You can look at the glass as half empty or you can look at it as half full. The choice is yours. Okay, moving right along, self-care tip, tips and techniques. Very, very important. We talked about in the beginning how it's very important for your mental state to be good, your physical state to be good, and your spiritual. So number one, prayer and meditation. Pray, pray, and pray. That's what got us through slavery. That's what got us through Jim Crow. That's what got us through the harsh realities of living here in America. It was prayer and meditation. Europeans couldn't understand with all of the brutality that was heaped up on us, how y'all able to survive? How are you able to find hope? Hope is a very powerful tool, very powerful mechanism in spite of what has happened to us that we can continue to grow and build and strive and struggle and do what we have to do in order to survive. So pray, 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 meditate, meditate, meditate. Two. Breathing exercise, regulate and realign the body emotionally. If we had time, I wanted to do a breathing exercise with you guys. I don't think we're gonna have time because uh, I wanna open the floor up for questions. But basically a, a, a breathing exercise is, is, is simply closing your eyes, taking time out of your day to do some self-reflection, like gratitude self-reflection, how God has just blessed you. We talked about in the beginning how if you still you're still here after uh, how uh, looking at how COVID has impacted us and you haven't contracted the virus, you're blessed and highly favored. So by number two, breathing exercise, regulating and realigning your body emotionally, you just take a moment out of your day and you self reflect and you say, God, thank you, thank you for giving me another opportunity to get this thing right called life. Thank you for the many blessings. The fact that I can breathe, I can hear, I can still taste, I can still move. You know, look at the guy who can't walk. Look at the guy who's handicapped. Look at the guy who just lost his kidney, you know? So you're blessed. So three, self-care tips and techniques. Listening to soft music, very important. Four, particularly, this is very important for men and women, but definitely our men. Getting proper rest and short naps throughout the day reinvigorates the body. Anybody who's ever traveled overseas, you go to Europe, between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock, they take what they call a siesta. Mm -hmm. When you take a nap during the mid midday, it just reinvigorates, it re-energizes the body. A lot of times in America, because we just, we work like slaves and we work all day, it'll wear you out. So at the end of the day, you're absolutely drained. You have no energy because you didn't take time to re-energize the body. So, you know, if you work a job and you can take a short nap in your car for 15 to 20 minutes, you'll be surprised how that little short nap, what we call power nap, can kind of give you a little bit more energy to work throughout the day. When you don't do that, you just, you just, you just stretch your body to the max. Five, proper water hydration and eliminating, eliminating sugary drinks. Let me start with sugary drinks. If you need a dictionary to decode what you're getting ready to drink, you probably shouldn't be drinking it. Most of that stuff they sell in the stores are just trash, coupled with more trash. It's just simply no good. 
proper water hydration, particularly room temperature, flushing your colon, flushing all of the stuff that you, you've eaten the day before or early in the day. And this is very important too. If you're eating three meals a day and you only eliminate once a day, you have two meals that are sitting in your colon that are fermenting, setting up ba uh, ba uh, bacteria and disease. And it opens the door to more diseases and things like that. So you have to, you should, if you're eating three times a day, you should definitely be eliminating three times a day, if not more. And by drinking water and having a proper water hydration, it flushes out whatever's in your colon. So it's very important. Six, daily wellness checks to see where you are emotionally. You should be taking your blood pressure on a regular basis. You should do just daily wellness reflection just seeing where you are emotionally. Like I said in the beginning, Sister Robin, all of us have moving parts. Moving parts, you're dealing with your job, you might be dealing with a supervisor, you might be dealing with a boss, you might be dealing with a sibling, you might be dealing with your child. You're dealing with all these different kinds of things that affect you emotionally, but you have to remember and put yourself at the top of the list. Seven, self-reflecting or self-reflection. We just kind of talked about that. Eight, a lot of people don't do this, but I recommend this to my clients a lot of times writing in a journal, your thoughts and feelings about different things that you encounter on a daily basis. Why is that important? Because it allows you to purge, keyword purge. That in the clinical world is what we call cathartic. What is cathartic? Cathartic just simply means all of that residual uh, 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 toxicity or toxins that are in your body, you purge it emotionally by writing or you express it through drawing, which is number nine, drawing or drawing your feelings on paper. Okay, you may not wanna write, well, then just draw, okay? Draw your feelings, you're getting it out. You don't wanna keep it in, when you keep it in, it causes depression, and at some point you explode, okay? And it could be a slight little thing that sends you over the edge, but when you allow to get it out in a therapeutic, cathartic kind of way, it helps you emotionally, socially, psychologically, and then you're okay to be, you, you um, you're okay to be around others because you're not walking around with all this baggage, okay? It was an artist a few years ago. I, it might have been uh, Lauren Hill that talked about baggage. No, no, it wasn't. It was Erica Badu. How we walk around with all of this baggage, mm -hmm. and sometimes we don't even realize it, okay? Number ten, recognizing your triggers. You might have anger management issues. You may have a short fuse. Anything may set you off. So is it very important to recognize your triggers? And if you know that's a trigger for you, then try to avoid certain situations. 11, take time to observe nature. How many people actually go for a walk and observe nat nature? We know the weather's changing, particularly in the part of the country that we are. But um, you know, I'm happy to say, Sister Robin, I just recently purchased a bike and I go over to uh, Forest Park and I ride 30 to 40 miles a day. And I'm telling you, it is so beautiful to ride around the lake over in Spanish Lake or Forest Park and just observe nature or going for a walk in your neighborhood. Nature is God's healing bomb for us to absorb and internalize. And it helps us to see the beauty and the, and the wonderment of God and nature itself. And it's very therapeutic. So, you know, if you're in a part of the country where the weather's still good, do it. Take advantage of it. Move right along. Number 12, getting daily exercise in, hiking and fishing. I am amazed, Mel, with the people that I talk to every single day that don't make time for exercise. I know people who work a job and they may work in, um, uh, in a cafeteria or they may work in uh, some aspect of the university or school and they're moving, but that's not exercise. That's, that's a job related activity. When you engage in an exercise, that's a solo independent experience that allows you to just kind of zone out, do some self-reflection, compartmentalize whatever you might be dealing with in your own manner and in your own kind of way. That is so therapeutic. So I'm amazed how many people, they don't take time to exercise. You give your allegiance to this job or you give your allegiance to everything else and you put it off. And guess what? You're opening the door for just major problems on the back end of life. I can tell you, anybody who's been in the hospital, one day in the hospital will set you back 20 years. 
as they say in the church, you didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. One day, one, oh, God forbid you stay in there one week. God forbid they had to give you some medication. Lord have mercy. You're in some trouble. So if you can get it right on the front end versus the back end, then that's a very good thing. 13, establishing a daily and weekly routine. Man, I can't emphasize this enough. Try to establish a day, a day of the week or every day in the week at a certain time where you just shut it down. Take your nap, take your power walk, do whatever you need to do, but make yourself first and foremost on, the, on that to-do list. If you do it intermittently, it's gonna be a struggle, uh, Brother James. It's gonna be a struggle because you're doing it intermittently. You wanna keep this in mind, brothers and sisters, as a clinician, we're creatures of habit either good habits or bad habits. So when you install and implement good habits, then it becomes perpetual, it becomes ritualistic, and it's something you do on an everyday basis. But when you just do it on a Monday and you don't do it again for Thursday and then you might do it next week, then your goals, the goals you reach are gonna be meager. But if you have that consistency, you're gonna maximize the opportunity to achieve your goals. And you gotta take time for yourself. You just have to do it and try to establish that routine. 14, find an accountability partner. Anybody who, who's ever gone to a gym know that if you have a partner, when you lazy and you don't wanna get up and you have a partner, then you can move a little bit further because you have somebody that's holding you accountable. When, uh, when you don't have accountability partner, it's easy to fall off, okay? I'm gonna move uh, a little fast. The time is moving real quick. Uh, 16, change your diet to a more plant-based diet instead of a large meat consumption. That kind of speaks for itself. I wish we had time to go into it, but that's a whole nother subject. But try to reduce your meat consumption. 17, animals in nature that are vegetarians, elephants, giraffes, rhinos, uh, rhinos, gorillas, bisons, rabbits, cows, and horses. You know, in America, uh, Sister Robin, we've been taught that you get uh, protein from meat and that our meat should cons our diet should consist of meat, dairy, and cheese. A lot of those things, they clog up your colon, they clog up your arteries. And these animals are some of the strongest animals in creation. I think an elephant, the average weight is about 4,000 pounds. A giraffe, a rhino, a gorilla, you know, a horse. And they're all vegetarians. So it just goes to show you we don't uh, necessarily need meat. Now, I want you to say, Brother Juma, your presentation was on point, man, but I'm not getting ready to stop eating meat. Okay, well, that's your, that's your choice. I'm just throwing that out to you and I'm giving you a reference point. Various animals in nature, they don't eat meat and they're still strong and they're not missing a beat. 18, check your blood pressure on a regular basis. 19, think prevention versus intervention. There's a saying that it's easy. Melvin, this is very important. There's a saying that it's easier to be healthy and stay healthy than to get sick and try to get yourself healthy again. If you don't remember nothing else that was said today, remember that it is easier to be healthy and stay healthy than to get yourself sick and try to recover from that experience. It's very difficult and very costly. Costly. 20, turn off social media, take a break for a while. Sometimes, you know, I'm an avid CNN watcher, but when you look at it, the majority of the information that comes across CNN and most news networks is so negative. It can have an impact on you emotionally, socially, and psychologically to where you think nothing but gloom and doom. Again, black men have the highest rate of prostate cancer in the world. And nobody can seem to understand why our numbers are so much higher than anybody else in the world. Stress, stress, stress and anxiety is taking us off the planet. It's literally killing us because we haven't learned how to manage it and we haven't learned how to incorporate some of the changes that we're talking about uh, into our daily lives. Okay, some other things I want you to avoid, think about. White sugar, white salt, white flour, white rice, and white bread. All these things have been bleached. The color out of them, all of them are deadly. All of them are destructive. All of them impact your health one way or the other. White sugar, white salt, white flour, white rice, and white bread. Do your own research on it. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to believe me. Just check it out, okay? Um, Okay, a couple, let me see something. I wanna do something. I wanna 
I want to fast forward because time is getting away. Uh, these are alternative strategies, but we won't run through them right now because I want to leave the floor open for questions. But I'll just, I'll read one of them. You must find your purpose in life. Do what you love to do, and you'll never work again. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Some more to relieve the body of tension and stress. Exercise may include walking, running, biking, stretching, a sport of your choice. Exercise consistently in order to derive the benefits that come with the sustainability. Uh, eat to live instead of living to eat. Remember your body is your temple, so take care of it. Uh, drink more water since the body is composed mainly of water. Get adequate rest. Take a vacation. I don't know when the last time you've been on vacation. Get you a vacation, please. Make it happen. Surround yourself with people who affirm you. Strive to live a stress. Strive to live a stress-free life as best as you possibly can. Uh, do not live in the past. Uh, create the change that you want out of life. Make time to have fun and live in the moment. Seek professional therapy by a trained clinician who can help you. Find a support group. Travel internationally once in your life to see how others live in order to have a basis of comparison. Remember, your world is as big as you make it. Uh, now, this is deep. You might want to take a, a picture of this with your, with your camera phone. This is one of the most powerful slides. I'm going to hit a couple more, and then we're going to open the floor up. Uh, and again, you can get this presentation. I'll email it to you, Sister Robin. But you definitely want to get a picture of this. This is deep, 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 and more deep. So this is the Dalai Lama, the brother down here. And the question is asked, the Dalai Lama, when asked what surprised him most about humanity, he answered man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money. Then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health. And then he is so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. Result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He's li he lives as if he's never going to die, and then he die, then he dies having never really lived. Boy, that's worth the price of tea in China. I'm gonna read it just one more time. Take a picture of it, and you should read it every day. And I think it's gonna have a serious impact on you. You think about it. Most of us who worked these jobs for the last 30 years. I know a lady who worked at the Wayne Wright Building in Children's Services for almost 30 years. She got 29 and a half years under her belt. And they just laid off about 25 people. And they would not, they would not give her her retirement because she didn't complete a total of 30 years. They denied her an opportunity uh, to get her retirement. And that's that's an indictment. A woman no fault of her own, worked 29 and a half years, had six months to go, and they wouldn't allow her to get 30 years. And in that same office, they had a lady to die in that same office that they didn't tell the other employees about. And the other employees saw a new person coming into their office and they wondered where the previous person was. And they found out that she had died and they never told her until a new person had replaced her. And so here we are, we work in these jobs for 30 years and you get a key or you get a cup or something like that. And a lot of times we never really, we, we never really know what life is all about. Most African-Americans live a life of drudgery because we just live in to pay a bill. My thing is, you know, you, you came in this world owing people, you're gonna leave out of this world owing people. White folks get paid on the back end. Find a way to get you find a way to get you a vacation. Find a way to do something that you enjoy. And don't let your whole life just be filled with drudgery. So I'm gonna read it real quick because we're almost out of time. Dalai Lama when asked what surprised the most about humanity answered, man, because he sacrifices his health. That's what we've been talking about in order to make money. Then he sacrifices money, trying to get it back. And then he's so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. The result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he's never going to die and then dies, having never, never really lived. Boy, that's worth the price of tea in China. Okay, I'm gonna give you just one of these, maybe two, and then we'll open the floor and we're gonna make it the uh, total fun. Uh, five things people regret while on their deathbed. And this is number one. And think about your own mortality. 
I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not life others expected of me. This was the common regret of all. When people realize that their life is almost over and look back clearly on it, it is easy to see how many dreams have gone unfulfilled or you live in the best version of yourself. Most people have not honored even a half of their dreams and had to die knowing that it was due to choices they made. We talked about choices are not made. It's very important to try and honor at least some of your dreams along the way. From the moment that you lose your health, it is too late. Health brings a freedom very few realize until they no longer have it. Is that not what we've been talking about? These are the five regrets that people have. Two, I wish I didn't work so hard. We just talked about that. This came from every male patient that I nursed. They missed their children's youth and their partner's companionship. Women also spoke of this regret, but as most were from an older generation, many of the female patients had not been breadwinners. All of the men I nursed deeply regretted spending so much of their life on the treadmill of a work existence. By, simplify, by simplifying your lifestyle and making conscious choices along the way, it's your life. You become happier and more open to new opportunities, ones more suited to your new lifestyle. Remember that the clock is ticking, brother. and sisters. One of my best friends of 40 years, I lost maybe about three or four years ago. He worked for St. Louis Public Schools. He was a safety officer. I got a call from Colonel Lisa Turner, Lisa uh, Taylor, who called me and said, Brother Juma, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, your buddy just passed away. And I'm like, wait, man, I just saw him last week where it goes, Jim. And true enough, he had died of a heart attack. And I'm, I'm like, man, life is so unfair. This thing called life is not fair. And the brother had passed away, you know, at 58 years of age. So, you know, we, we got to take a look at where we are and uh, what tomorrow looks like real quick. Number three. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. Many people suppress their feelings. Again, that causes an internal resentment, rage, uh, depression, frustration. Many people suppress their feelings in order to keep pace with others. As a result, they settle for a mediocre existence and never became who they were truly capable of becoming. Many develop illnesses relating to the bitterness and resentment they carry as a result. Boom, 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 boom. That's somebody on this phone. Y'all know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to call no names. You know who you are. If the shoe fit, wear it. We cannot control the reaction of others. However, although people mainly initially react when you change the way you are by speaking honestly, in the end, it raises the relationship to a whole new and healthier level. Either that or it relate, releases the unhealthy relationship from your life. Either way, you win. You got to take an evaluation where you are. Okay? Time for the bird to come out the cage. Number four. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. Often they would not truly, often they would not truly realize the full benefits of old friends until their dying weeks. And it was not always possible to track them down. Many had become so caught up in their own lives that they had let golden friendships slip by, slip by over the years. There were many deep regrets about not giving friendships the time and effort they deserve. Everyone misses their friends when they are dying. Uh, a couple of brothers that I grew up with for the past eight, nine years, we get together as a brotherhood and we take trips different places throughout the United States and we fellowship and it's so therapeutic. And these are brothers that I grew up with 30, 40 years ago. When right along, it is common for anyone in a busy lifestyle to let friendship slip. But when you're faced with your approaching death, the physical details of life fall away. People want to get their financial affairs in order if possible. But if, but if it's not money or status that holds the true importance for them, they want to get things in order more for the benefit of those they, they love. Usually, though, they are too ill and weary to even, ever manage this task. It is all that remains in the final weeks, love and relationships. That's all you have. People don't know how did you treat them. And this is the last one, and we're going to open the floor for questions. Five things people regret while on the deathbed. Number five, I wish that I had let myself be happier. This is you. I'm talking to you. If you're on this phone or the Zoom call, this is not an accident. You were supposed to be on this call. I'm talking to you directly and personally. This is surprisingly a common one. Many do not realize until the end that happiness is a choice. Stop depending on other people to make you happy. Make your own self happy, okay? 
We all come here with an expiration date. I'm going to say it again. We all come here with an expiration date. You don't know how long you're going to be here. Live your best life. They had stuck in old patterns and habits. The so-called comfort of familiarity overflowed into their emotions as well as their physical lives. Fear of change had them pretending to others and to their to themselves that they were content. When deep within, they longed to laugh properly. They have silliness in their life again. How many of you all take time to laugh? Very important. When you're on your deathbed, what others think of you is a long way from your mind. How wonderful it is to be able to let go and smile again long before you're dying. That was the last one. And let me just read this to you. This is definitely the last one, last slide. And then as you see, we have group feedback. This is where you come in. So. This is uh, the poem that Mandela read when he was released from prison. It's called Our Deepest Fear. If you Google it or you YouTube it, it'll come up. And uh, make this applicable or applicable to your own life. Our deepest fear. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. I'm talking about you on this phone. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Don't worry about what you don't have. Focus on what you do have. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? God made each one of us with a different, unique, distinctive DNA. And it's important that you connect with that. Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of who? God. Your playing small does not serve the world. I'm talking about you. There's nothing enlightened us. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so other people won't feel insecure around you. Let your light shine. We are meant to shine as children do. We're born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it is in every single one of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So I wanna leave you with that. I wanna open the floor for questions and uh, we're gonna go from there. And if we have time, I'll share a final story with you. People always remember stories. So it's feedback time now, guys. Uh, let's ask, let's open the floor for some questions and go from there. Doc, uh, God bless you. And what enlightenment you've given us today. This is Victor Brooks with the Empowerment Network. And I had a brother earlier this year uh, who took his life. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He would often take meds and then feel better but felt he could stop taking them because he was feeling better and not realizing that was the reason that he needed to stay with the meds. How do you influence someone who may have that kind of difficulty accepting that they need to stick with the regiment that the doctors are giving them? Well, number one, they should stay with the doctor's recommendation. They really should. Uh, what the doctor hopefully did or should have done is uh, recommend a supportive program like ongoing cognitive therapy, supportive therapy, group therapy. See, when you have all of them working in tangent with one another, then you have the best of all worlds. You don't want to solely rely on medication, but you want to examine the underlying yeah. symptoms that led to you having to be on medication in the first place. You know, medicine medicine addresses symptoms, but it don't exam it doesn't doesn't speak to the root. Some, somebody needs to put their phone on mute. Somebody got a little noise in the background. So medicine doesn't uh, necessarily address the root of the problem. So that's why it's imperative that you identify someone who can help you understand the root of the problem, help you work through those issues, help you to find meaningful alternative solutions that speak to the problem and uh, move you closer to a more holistic, healthy disposition and outlet. But an individual shouldn't just take it upon themselves to get off the medication because you can have a reaction. And right. so you, you don't want that situation either. So the goal should be to try to work yourself off of medication, but you don't want to abruptly stop, making, uh, stop taking uh, uh, medication because your body's gotten used to it. So you're going to have a physiological, emotional, social, and psychological response and reaction, and that could be detrimental and cause a patient, a patient or a person to take their own life or commit suicide. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So brothers and sisters, I'm not able to see how many people on the line. I think if I minimize my screen, I might have a full screen. I can kind of see what Sister Robin is seeing. Uh, let me see if I could do that. There's 24, have, there's 24 people on the line. Okay, let me try. I want to be able to see what you're looking at, Sister Robin. Uh, yes. Hey, Brother Alvin, I see, I see your Brother Alvin is over here uh, with the fountain of youth, and he, and he won't tell me what he's doing. But uh, it's good to see you, Brother Alvin, Brother Liam. I can see some of you. I'm going to try uh, to... Take your screen down. Okay. And you might be able to spread out all the way across. Okay, I see Brother Chris there. Trying to let me see. So, brother, and sisters, open the floor while I kind of mess around with. Hey, brother Mike, how you doing? All the way from Phoenix, man. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. It's good to see everybody. Yeah, I just I just wanted to put this one thing out here. Um, when you were talking about this, uh, this water, I didn't realize how big of a thing this was. Um, and um, I just been trying to like do some like little, you know, some habits just to, you know, just to, you know, improve the quality of my life. And it's funny, my wife had got me this water bottle uh, for I think like Christmas or something. It was like a liter water bottle. And, um, and I just wasn't feeling like myself and I was having uh, headaches and I didn't realize that, um, I didn't realize it until we uh, went hiking that I, that I was dehydrated. And I said, man, I'm probably dehydrated most of the time and don't even know it. So I got this water bottle and I started, I told myself that I was gonna drink two, two bottles a day and I started doing that. And let me tell you what happened. Number one, I lost 10 pounds um, because I wasn't eating as much. Number two, all the, cause I would often struggle with like uh, sugar um, like, you know, want to eat sweet stuff. Um, I don't really deal with that anymore because the water is flushing it out of my system or I'm just not desiring it in the first place. Um, the other thing, I mean, so many different things, like I have more clarity, I can focus more. Um, I just feel better. So, um, and there's a whole bunch of other things, but I just wanted to put that out there. I didn't realize how, how much that water uh, was helping me, um, but it is really, really helping. So uh, I definitely, um, definitely a good point there. Thank you, Brother Michael. It's good to see you, man. This brother's doing a lot of good work, um, actually all over the world. You wanna just take a couple seconds to kind of tell people what you're doing all over the globe? You know, um, to tell you the truth, um, the, 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 the main thing that I'm doing right now is just focusing on, believe it or not, and this is, this is a big, big story, I kind of, I try to simplify, but the, the, the main thing I'm focused on right now is us. Um, and specifically what I'm talking about is so a lot of these things like you're talking about, um, I've got a, a project that I'm working on right now, it's called RafikiNow.com, and it's just an opportunity for, for Black folks to talk to other Black folks. Um, what, whatever you need to talk about. Um, uh, you know, a lot of folks um, uh, in, in a survey that we did, they said that they had people in their life that they, they are close to, but they don't really, they can't relate to them when they re really need to talk to them the most. So sometimes, you know, um, just having a conversation with someone um, can be, you know, healing. Um, and of course, you know, if you need, you know, you need therapy or if you need some kind of coaching and, you know, that's, that's another path, but this is just a platform or I'll put the thing in here in the chat um, for folks just to talk. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, and beyond that, just um, uh, doing a lot of uh, executive and leadership coaching, group and team coaching for, um, for uh, the, you know, leaders in our community, you know, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs and so forth, executives, you talk about a lot of stress, um, and um, I recently surveyed 35 um, uh, Black uh, and Indigenous people of color about what their concerns are specifically around work. I have a page and a half, a page and a half of people concerned about all these things that you were talking about today, specifically with, you know, with COVID, with, uh, with racism, all these kinds of things. And it is in, uh, affecting uh, their life and, and how they uh, address those um, how they're showing up in the world, how they're unable to be fully present and to be happy and to have that that laughter and so forth. So uh, 
so yeah, so I do executive coaching and leadership coaching and business coaching and so forth around that. And just, I'm just, I'm thinking about us um, right now. And that for me, um, you know, we talk about being open and honest earlier. For me, that wasn't always the case because, you know, I, I, even though I grew up around most of, you know, folks who look like us, you know, I had, you know, went to the military and got the college degree and all these kinds of things. And so I was able to kind of like catapult, you know, out of a lot of the everyday um, situations that many of us face and kind of have forgotten a little bit that, hey, you know, <laughs> shoot, at the end of the day, I'm black too. And so- yeah, you um, can't, well, yeah. you'll, you'll always be reminded of that. Brother, uh, <laughs> Mike, let's get a few more people in. Okay, folks. sorry, y'all. That's okay, you. brother. Brother Al, Greer, it's good to see you, man. You've been hiding on me, brother. You've been hiding on me. I'm gonna have to come track you down. <laughs> How you doing, brother? You got a question? Sure. Um, what is hypnosis and um, what would make that a good idea or at all? Uh, hyp hypnosis is a very powerful tool. It's a transcendental state where a person like myself can kind of tap into your subconscious mind. Uh, all your behavior is... is, is um, driven or impacted by your subconscious mind. I may say something verbally, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's what I feel. And so as a clinician, I would tap into your subconscious mind because that's where all your behavior is controlled by. It's, 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 it's like the brain, so to speak. So it's a way of tapping into your subconscious mind. And, and as clinicians, what we do, we're able to kind of realign those um, sequential parts of you to make them work in harmony for your best interest. I don't know if that made sense to you, but it's a way of really tapping into your subconscious mind where the root of your thinking lies. So oh. it's, it, it's, it, it's great for helping people who have phobias, who, who, may, be who may struggle with heights, who may struggle with uh, smoking, who may struggle with overeating. So you know, we, we're able to tap into those parts of you. All of us are made of made up of parts. Uh, and these parts are designed to do certain things for us. And so what we try to do is get those parts to work in harmony as opposed to working against each other. So it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I see. I don't know if that made sense, but. Yeah, it, it does. Brother Chris McBride, talk to me. Well, I have pages of notes from this, and thank you so much for what you've shared with us today. Um, as a recent uh, prostate cancer survivor, it was a year ago last month, um, you know, it's definitely made me take a, a different look about my life. Um, there was a lot of things that you said that I've already put in place um, from my key learnings from just being a prostate cancer survivor over this past year, so it was really good to hear that solidified again from hearing from someone else too as well. And uh, the support from everybody on this call has just been life-changing for me and my family too as well. So thank you for that. And it's putting me in a place where I'm speaking uh, to others to start looking at uh, having themselves uh, tested and checked out. I am constantly talking about this every day to whomever will listen to me, rather they want to listen or not, I'm mentioning it anyway. And um, just to let the group know too as well, there was two of my employees. Uh, they got themselves tested just recently, just from my own testimony. And um, I believe it was just within the last week. And then also one of my caregivers and best friend who was there with me a year ago, uh, is um, having his PSA uh, checked last week. So we're just waiting on the outcome. So I'm just um, enjoying life. And uh, uh, as you can see, <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but I I'm going to take this information and let it simmer, do some check marks, circle the stuff that I already have in place and the others that I need to do more. And the gentleman just got to speaking with water. I was doing the water thing here too as well. And he is so right because I do feel better 
uh, after drinking water and have removed a lot of sugary stuff. And I am the donut candy king. And so I've had to take all that out of my diet. So uh, <laughs> do what I have to do. Um, I think uh, you also mentioned to us well as excuses or the nails used to build a house of uh, failure. So that really sat with me because um, I used to be that person that always had excuses and um, I changed that years ago and stuff. And so when you mention that, um, I'm definitely gonna put that on my screensaver uh, right now at work too as well to keep reminding me of, uh, of that. Well, thank you, Brother Chris. You know, as a former teacher and everything, I, I, I can see the screen now so I can see all my students. And so uh, I, I used to always call on the students that didn't have their hands up. So uh, I don't know if you guys are okay with me calling on you or if you just wanted to jump in there. Uh, but Dewan, it's good to see you, brother. Uh, Sister Lima, you're like, you ready to come out the bullpen and say something? But, then, you know, I don't want to go teaching mode and just call on you. Anybody who feels the spirit, you know, I don't want time to get away and you don't ask a question either. Oh, I have a question. All right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. My question is, how do you motivate family members or, or inspire family members to get over the fear of getting tested because I've had this conversation with one of my family members and uh, his response is always, uh, well, I, I already was tested last year, but why should I get retested? Um, I think it's the fear of what if. And so what should I do about that? Because well, I already said that you'd rather know in advance so that you can get treated if there is an issue instead of waiting until it's too late because my father passed away from cancer. You know, and uh, it was too late by the time he found out. He didn't live 90 days after he found out. So, gotcha. uh, yeah. He, and I don't think he's ever been tested or anything. He just got sick, couldn't keep anything down, was having diarrhea, went to the doctor. He thought he had the flu. And by the time he got there, it, it was really too late for him. So, gotcha. I'm going to give you three quick responses, then I'm going to ask somebody else to jump in. Uh, for anything that I may have, have uh, left off. I always say prevention is always better than intervention. Mm -hmm. If you can catch it on the front end versus the back end, you always a leg up. So prevention is always better on the front end. The mm -hmm. second thing is you can be stubborn, you can be rigid, uh, and you can die in silence, or you can, you can die in ignorance and silence as a result of your ineptness or inability to move forward and go get tested. So that's a result of uh, being in denial or minimizing or procrastinating. Mm -hmm. So you, you consequently die in silence and ignorance. Uh, you, you said, how do you, how do you motivate family members? Well, uh, or how do you inspire? I think that was the key word you said, inspire. Uh, inspiration is a personal thing. Some people, you can tell something one time and they get it, boom. They go into the doctor. Some people, you got to tell a hundred times. But my thing is, if you love that person, you just continue to try. You try to educate, educate, educate educate more. They may get it. They may not get it. I don't know. It's an individual kind of thing. Like I said, inspiration comes from within. Uh, I said it on the conference call. There's usually two things that move people, either inspiration or desperation. Where you go to a doctor, you get the diagnosis, you find out you're in, you in stage two, stage three. You got to do something now. So, you know, that's just my little kind of knee jerk response to that. Uh, if you love them, you continue to try to educate and also be patient with them. You know, nobody wants to hear that diagnosis. So, uh, yeah, we know on the front end is better, but on the back end, if you do have it, you're scared to death. I heard Melvie say it many times. When you hear that, when you, when the doctor tell you, you got cancer, everything, everything else that's said after that, you don't hear. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can understand the resistance. I get it. Anybody else want to chime in and just get a sister response? Something yeah, that I may that. have left off. Brother Jum, I do real quick. Okay. That a lot of times it's 
it takes somebody who's been on that same journey to maybe give it a bit of credibility. So some kind of way you got to connect him with somebody that's been through this and some people who have survived it because see, a lot of times people get counseling from people who don't even have a clue about prostate cancer. They give them all the myths and people hold on to the myths. They need to talk with someone who has been through it the whole journey. You know, even though our journeys are all different, they can talk to a couple people, but get them connected with the empowerment network. That's what we're here for. I think that's an excellent response, Brother Juan. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Brother yeah, James, go, go ahead, Brother Leroy. Yeah, uh, I echo that is that the Empowerment Network is the, is the place uh, when we have exhausted all and before we exhausted, now that you know that there is an organization uh, that is there to help, uh, that's the best place. Sometimes it's hard even to get them to come to even to the Empowerment Network, but if some kind of way you can get that person there, it's really there. Leroy, a 17 year survivor which means that I was already a, a uh, survivor prior to. But I'm so thankful that I was seeing uh, Melvie, I guess it was Saturday, yesterday, is that I know why I'm here. Uh, oh, and oh, I oh, one second, just Leroy. Somebody got a little noise in the background. Make, make sure your phone is on mute. Go, go ahead, my brother, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, thank you. I was um, just saying that I know why I'm here. And just what Dewan is saying is, and what you said also in your presentation, you know, uh, we need to give something. We need to set a legacy. And it's better to give than receive. I, I believe in that. Um, and I have received so much by way of Melody uh, in the Empowerment Network. Uh, it's a blessing to hear those comments that are coming from survivors that have done it. I've seen those come in and uh, uh, they live in a better life. And I can see that they, they don't have to tell me, I can tell by their demeanor from when they first came until after they have went through and on this journey. So that's the inspiration to me to see people's lives changing uh, right before you. When you look and you see, I'm a nature runner myself. I like watching nature outside. I, I walk early in the morning and just wanna go out in the park. For me, I'd rather be in the park you know, than out inside the building. That's just for me, because I feel so much closer to nature. And when I'm around people, I'm the same way because we're all different. I really appreciate your presentation because you're talking about people and we are different. So uh, if the young lady can get the, the, the young man to, to come to the Empowerment Network one time, just one time, uh, it can make a difference. And I've seen that so many times that I heard the testimony so many times of individuals coming and just one time they had to come again. I've I got a nephew that came with me and he started coming often, often, every meeting he was there. And he was at like in his early, late thirties, early forties, you know? And so, uh, and, and just because the fact he came, you know, he's more educated and he loved coming. The Empowerment Network, there's none other like it, none other. I agree. And if we, if we got just do, it would be so widespread, but we don't get just do. We don't. And that's the society we live in. Those in, individuals that could make the empowerment network better than what it is, they just don't give us just do. But that's okay. We, we, we're going to keep grinding. Bro, Leroy, let's try, to get a, let's try to get a couple more people in. Aleem, I see some thoughts in your head, brother. I'm reading your mind. What's, get, talk to me real quick, and we want to get Brother James in there. And uh, brother Andre, I know you 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 ready too. I'm not gonna let you off the hook, brother. So come on, brother Ling. So All right, brothers. Well, and sisters, I I mean, this is so important to being a prostate cancer survivor or just a survivor in general because the mental component it does control everything. I battled PTSD and a few other things, and uh, pretty much what you were saying. In the presentation is what we go through um, with my PTSD group that I meet with weekly. So it's great, like the brother said, get out, get some fresh air, journal. Do you know, after I left the job, 
all the flashbacks from being in war, being on the front line, smelling and seeing dead bodies and all kinds of stuff. 25 years later, that came back and visited me because my life's kind of slowed down and it wasn't as busy anymore. And so I'm just trying to overcome that. But yeah, the journaling is so critical, man. Whatever you feel in, no matter what you're, where you are in your life, write it down. So you can go back and reflect on it. You can release some of that negative energy. Drink plenty of water, like the brother said, and get some fresh air and, and eat better. You know, all that affects our well-being. And I have to say this, because Melvi is like a daddy to me, and uh, brother Isidore is like an uncle to me. And them brothers took me under their wings, man. They took very good care of me. And I can say that, and I appreciate that for what they've done, and all the brothers in the organization, you know, we got a great situation, 10 in France. They don't get no better than that. So if there's anybody struggling with anything, come come, come here to Zoom since we can't meet in person, which it kind of affect everybody too, but at least I get to see everybody in person. So thank you, brother, for the presentation. And maybe we can continue to keep doing this maybe once a month or however we see fit, but it's very, very, very important. Thank you, Dr. Thank Julie. you. You know, this thing is so beautiful, this Zoom. You know, this is us adjust, uh, adjusting and adapting during this pandemic crisis. Because just think about it, to try to get almost 25, 30 people in, in one place, gas, travel, time, preparation to come, go, and we can link up by a computer and nobody has to even leave the, the house. Man, this is beautiful. This is powerful. And we have to keep it going. Come on, Brother James. We got a few more, few more minutes. We're going to have Brother Andre. Uh, probably close us out so we can stay on time. Come on, talk to me. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm very happy for your presentation today. It was very informative and much needed information. Uh, very inspiring. Uh, there's some things on your list I'm doing. And so I was happy to hear that. There's some things on your list I need to do. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to work on that. And uh, I'm happy for the, uh, the 10, the, the Empower Network, uh, this has to be a, a very great uh, organization. If your doctor uh, tells you that you need to be a part of this organization. And so I was very happy that he introduced me to this group. Uh, I am a COVID survivor and uh, I'm a prostate cancer survivor. So uh, it looked like my health began to change after I retired and, you know, supposed to be now living my best life. <laughs> I find myself now more with doctors and hospitals and all that, but I'm still here. So I'm grateful for that. Unfortunately, I missed the presentation that you had. Uh, for some reason, I didn't get it. I don't know if anybody else uh, other than me, I didn't see it. But can you just give you, me a quick synopsis of what it was about? You, you, you missed everything? The whole presentation, I never came up on my screen. That's interesting. Sister Rosalyn, we have to... The, 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 you know, the video. Do, uh, Brother Juma, I'm going to put my email in the chat box, and when you send it to me, I'll send it to everybody who sends me their email. So anybody who wants it, if you send me your email, then okay. I will forward it to you when Brother Ajuma sends it to me. Is that good, Brother That's Juma? good. That's good. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to put it in there now. And you all just respond to that, and um, I'll make sure you get it. Okay. Brother Andre, talk to me real quick. We got a few minutes. Okay, brother. I like to say your uh, presentation was very powerful and encouraging, and I got a lot of pointers, uh, empowerment network, stay connected because our Zoom meetings, it keep us connected with each other and we still get to share that personal experience and then experience being with other brothers. So basically just to keep it short, I wanna say stay connected to the Empowerment Prostate Cancer Network because it's very powerful and it's very informative. And I wanna thank you brother for the presentation today and you're always uplifting and inspiring. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Brother Alvin, just give us a give us a 30 second, then we're gonna let Melvin close us out. And I know there's other people on the line, no disrespect. We're just trying to be respectable 
of everybody's time. Uh, I could be here for another hour. I don't care, but uh, we want to be respectable, respectful of everybody's time. So, brother Alvin, just just say something. This 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 young brother here, brother Alvin, you got to come off mute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Oh, we got you, brother. Man, it's one of the best presentations I ever heard, man. I used to listen to uh, Les Brown when he had his own show on television. I think he's the one who used to be married to uh, Gladys Knight. Am I right? That's correct. Yeah, but anyway, man, you gave up uh, one of the best presentations I ever heard. And I learned uh, a, a lot by hearing this today tonight. Well, thank you, Brother Alvin. This brother inspires me all the time. We talk every week, and uh, I still want—I still want a bottle of that fountain of youth you got over there, Brother Brother Alvin. Is probably what you about twenty years old, yeah, Brother I, Alvin. I, I look young, but I feel old. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, Brother. Well, well at least you—you fifty percent there. You, you're looking good, you know. Thank you, Brother Melvin. You get the—you the CEO, Brother. You get the last word. So, well, Brother brother's sisters. Before you uh, uh, get a last word, brothers and sisters, I, I, I pray that I've said something that has inspired you and motivated you. Uh, it came from the heart. I've enjoyed you. And I pray that God has used me as a vessel, as a conduit to empower you. And uh, I encourage you to take a real good look at your life, where you are and where you want to be. And take a very methodical day-by-day -day approach. You know, if you're trying to get in shape, you're not going to get in shape in one day. But you got to do it every day. You got to do it consistently. And you do it day by day by day. And you're going to be that much closer to your goal. So to God be the glory. I thank you. But Dewan, everybody, the Raw family, it's good to see you. I know there's other people who couldn't call on everybody. Sister Lorraine, I know you're listening. Thank you. Brother Mel, all yours. Okay, Dr. Jim, I just want to say your uh, your 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 lecture today was very powerful, very uplifting, and it was really, really eye-opening. So I, I want to say excellent, excellent, excellent. I want to say thank you. Thank you again, brother, for all that you do to help our organization. I think what I what was really powerful to me was a quote that you made that's on, in the Let's Brother Liam got his phone. Let's go. Get your clothes. Let's go. Sister Robin, can you uh, mute everybody? I think that's, there you go. I'm sorry, Melvy. I think, you know, it's a quote that's in my book and you, and you, and you hit it today when you said that prostate cancer is not a death sentence. It can really be a life sentence of servitude and advocacy because really that's the medicine to help to heal the health of the human spirit of all of us. When we can serve and help and share and give back. It empowers you more than it empowers the individual that you're helping, you know, and that's very, very powerful for all of us when we can take our setbacks and our setbacks can become our comebacks and we come back, you know, better than ever through our advocacy, through our serving and through our helping, which really your helping becomes your healing. So I want to really ask all our prostate cancer survivors is get more involved with the Empowerment Network. Let's keep that message of getting tested. That is really like our war cry here in the organization, get tested, get tested for prostate cancer, you know? And, and I know the sister was at, she asked that question. You know, you can tell that your counterpart, early detection is the best protection. Early detection can save your life. It saved my life and it saved the lives of the many men here on, the, on our Zoom call today. So I wanna say thank you, Dr. Joma. Thank you for what you do to help us to grow, help us to heal here in this organization. I want to thank everybody that took time on a Sunday evening or Sunday afternoon to be on the call today. And also look for more. We got more coming in the month of December, the month of January, and more month of February. We got more presentations this coming. So check your emails, check your text messages. Thank you again. Thank you. Peace, brothers. That's it. Robin, you any closing messages, anything, Robin? Uh, I see brother Al Greer has his hand up. He's had it up a minute. You wanna ask him what he's, if he needs something? Brother Greer, oh, 
there he is. I'm, I'm sorry, that's a mistake. That's a mistake, okay. All right, everybody have a good evening. Absolutely, be safe, be well. Be safe. All right, take Thank care. You. And mask up. Mask up, good night. Good night. Good night.